Hello again, witches, seekers, and friends, and welcome to the Fat Feminist Witch Podcast, the show where we do a little ranting, raving, and wand waving. I'm your host, Paige Vanderbeck, and together we're going to explore magic and spirituality, social justice, the psychic realm, and truly modern witchcraft. Hello, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining me today on the Fat Feminist Witch Podcast. This week, I have a really exciting double feature, two episodes, because I had the pleasure of interviewing two of the stars of a new documentary about modern witchcraft called Coven, which premiered last month on the CBC here in Canada. They both had availability on different days, so I had one-on-one time with each of them. Since I have a tendency to talk a lot when I have interesting guests on the show, I decided to give each of them their own episode. I do hope that you will listen to both because each guest, they had their own unique perspectives and stories and they're, they're both very well spoken. They're two very different interviews, but they really complement each other well. So I, I do hope that you'll listen to both. Before we get into our interview, let's talk about the film. So Coven follows three witches, all from Toronto, named Andra, Laura, and Leilani, who are all in the the millennial age range. They begin by introducing us to their own individual backgrounds in witchcraft and, and their life, you know, where they came from. Then they talk about the ways that witchcraft connects them to others or to other versions of themselves. And finally, they each travel to an ancestral place to explore ties that they all have to magic in their own lineage. I watched the movie over and over, not just to prepare for the interviews. I watched it after I was already done conducting them. Uh, And this is one of the very best documentaries about modern witchcraft and about modern witches that I have seen. Each one of the people in this this film is, is very unique, you know, and every tradition and style of practice that they explore is different. The cast is very diverse and they make um, a very overt connection with witchcraft, feminism, and for some of them, queer identity, and they explore it very beautifully. Two of the stars are also musicians, and their music, which is highly magical in nature, um, absolutely blew my mind, and I've been listening to it ever since. And, And I've mentioned it in my last episode. I will link to it in the description so you guys can explore it for yourself. The film is very well made. It's interesting all the way through. I was absolutely captivated. And when I got to the end, I felt I felt very good and I felt very excited. And I felt excited for the, the future of witchcraft and all of the really interesting, unique and individual ways that it, it will continue to grow from here. In this episode, I'm speaking with Andra Zlatescu, a witch, musician, artist and tarot reader who helps introduce us and Laura, to some local covens and teachers. Uh, And then she travels to Romania to explore her Romani and Romanian roots much more in depth. I'm so grateful that she was able to take the time to talk and to share a bit about, you know, what witchcraft means to her, how it influences her life, and then also, of course, her experience in making the film. So let's dive in. I hope you guys enjoy. Thank you so much for um, taking some time to talk to me today. I'm I'm really excited to um, to talk to you, and and I loved the film. I, I it was great. It was one of the best kind of modern documentaries about witchcraft that I've seen in a while. It was uh, it was relatable. It was a lot more like the the witches I've known in my life. So I'm very excited about it. I'm really excited too. I also find it kind of amazing that it's taken this long for somebody to make a documentary linking the relationship between witchcraft and feminism directly because it just (laughs) that is you're right that is such an odd like to me such an obvious connection yeah you know and I I even see that sometimes I'll see an article or, or something that's shared and it's like why are so many young women practicing witchcraft? And I'm like, what, what do you Shopping. mean now? <laughs> like, <laughs> like it, it seems to me that that's been happening for a pretty long time. And uh, often they don't really link the rise in, in the feminist movement and the rise in witchcraft being practiced, but uh, I see it everywhere. 
Yeah, absolutely. And even the reason women were traditionally persecuted as witches who weren't practicing witchcraft, you know, were often like, yeah. oh, this woman is powerful or independent or not depending on a man or doing something like off kilter to society's bounds. So it's always been deeply transgressive and about women's power. Absolutely. And this is where like those women didn't identify with witchcraft or even practice witchcraft. They were still being persecuted for like being women, you know, like yeah. really that was really their their biggest crime was being women and, and having having something that someone else wanted or just did not want them to have. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, sometimes it was like a cow. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. It's like you more cow than me. Unacceptable. <laughs> Your laundry came out cleaner than mine. You must be a witch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, um, it's sad to read those stories because I, I end up laughing and I'm like, it's not funny. I know it's not funny, but it sounds so absurd. Well, like I can't um, imagine thinking read... that way. Yeah, and then you read the Malleus Maleficarum, like the Hammer of the Witches. Um, and there's these accounts about like literally witches stealing men's dicks and like <laughs> sitting in a tree with like all of their stolen you know and it's just like the symbolism of like emasculation is so yeah. rampant and unhidden historically it is the main theme throughout texts like that and again they're funny to read until you remember like this got people yeah. killed <laughs> yeah, until you remember like the very real impact on yeah you know a very innocent person Absolutely. That's what's strange about fiction, where I can tell they they took things directly from it. I'm like, I I get why you could make fiction out of this because it sounded so fictional. But the fact that we're very comfortable fictionalizing that part of it is um, there's an ickiness to it. There's there's something to it that makes me feel a little bit uh, uncomfortable. Yeah, because the fictionalized aspect is almost always treating it as like a novelty or like a kind yeah. of horror or, you know, like, ooh, spooky, when in fact, like the horror is fear of women's bodies and what that means, you know? like Absolutely. Yeah, so I, I, I definitely appreciated that aspect of the film. Um, all three of you that, that were followed uh, through your journey here, you all mention that your identity as as a as a woman or um as a queer person for some of the other people that was that grew right along with your identity as a witch you know you you always felt like a witch is something that you said while some of the other cast members they said i knew i was different i didn't realize i was a witch it's um this identity as someone who is different or is not living the way society wants women to live yeah absolutely and I think that also goes back to like how our well-being is like mental physical emotional and spiritual and you can't rupture those things from each other you know if like one is being impacted or harmed by something they all are I absolutely agree I am um, they're all they're all, all important in the same in different ways but they all they're all a part of the same thing I know that definitely when I'm I'm going through hard times with a, my emotional or my physical health, spirituality is something that helps me get through that. Or it could be that my spirituality is suffering and that's a sign to me. I'm like, this, something else is also wrong. Like when you just feel so drained, like physically, mentally, emotionally, that you can't go outside of yourself to like do the rituals, you know? Like yeah. whether it's like a ritual of self-care or a ritual, you know, of like calling in some other kind of like fun to your well-being, like sometimes just lacking the energy to take those steps to manifest it. Um, yeah, can be very much like the link between those things. Absolutely. So I um I love this uh this theme in, in the film where you're everyone is is looking for a connection to to witchcraft, to their their past to their family to past lives um and to the their selves and their own life as a witch how do you feel that that connection has um, grown or changed since you made the film and since you went on this this journey Ooh. Hmm. 
That's a good question. <laughs> I think that the best way is to start at the beginning. So in the sense of I was raised on my dad and my grandmother's stories of the sacred and magical places at home in Romania and these beautiful traditions that were very like folkloric, very imbued with magic, um, you know, this worldview that everything is like sacred and interconnected and alive. And so my dad passed away six years ago and mm -hmm. Rama, the director of the film first approached me and initially just wanted an interview. We started talking on the phone and I started telling her some of his stories that he told me and you know of these places and so her response was that she wanted to bring me there she wanted to bring me to Romania she wanted to bring me to all of the places from my daddy's stories and so I think going on that journey and getting to be there was so magical and powerful because it connected me to him it connected me to my ancestral lineage it connected me to like the witchcraft traditions you know by meeting like practitioners who are very very like rooted in that land and mm -hmm. you know have carried those beliefs forward um that was extremely beautiful but through meeting all of them and going to all of these different places what was really solidifying about it was really just realizing that I already carry these truths in my heart I already know who I am you know I don't need it's beautiful and empowering having that validation from outside people. You know, it was absolutely beautiful and empowering meeting um, the coven of like traditional like Vrajitware who practiced in Romania and having them say, mm -hmm. you know, like you're here because of your blood and we welcome you like into our circle. And they initiated me on camera, which was like really intense and really vulnerable. Um, you know, and it was so powerful having them say like, no, you're here because like you have the blood, you're meant to be here, like you're meant to be here with us. And like, we want you to learn these things. And, you know, like I got to learn from them, I got to practice alongside them. Um, yeah. And so that was really, really empowering, you know, like, for me moving through the world, but ultimately, it just validated that I carry this truth wherever I go. And that's what people respond to, you know, and if you move through the world with integrity and good intention, like, you'll be met with that in return. And so I think it like, you realize too, that the only person who's like, putting the imposter syndrome in your head or putting the negative thoughts of like, oh, I can't do this. This isn't real. I'm not real. Like, you know, whatever it may be, like, is always you and you can go yeah. to like, ends of the world and meet, you know, like, some of the most powerful witches and they'll be like no you're here and we want you here and we're so happy you're here and you'll be you'll still be like what you must be wrong <laughs> you know? so I yes like that, absolutely <laughs> that change for me was just being like oh I've always carried this with me I've always carried like the magic of the lands I'm from like the power of my ancestry like my own inner truth and knowing wherever I go um and you know a lot of us I feel like have lots of experiences outside of ourselves that ultimately just bring us back to our own hearts. Absolutely. I am. Um, I have long felt that um, creative energy and magical energy are, I mean, they're, they're, they're the same. I know for me, they come from the exact same place. So I was not surprised to see that you're also a musician and an artist. And, you know, the, the other, the other witches in the film are as well. You're all very creative people. And, something I really loved is when you get to the end of the film, all of you say a similar thing where it's like, I am definitely a, a product of these, these people, these ancestors, these experiences, but in the end, my witchcraft is my own. And what I've created myself really is the most powerful thing. Yeah, absolutely. And like, we all stand at this crossroads of like all the different worlds we carry within us. And like all of us have shitty ancestors too. Like it's important mm -hmm. to romanticize our ancestors all so much because like ultimately they were just people. Um, yeah. And I absolutely agree with you about, you know, the creative force is like claiming our capacity as both creators and destroyers is part of what witchcraft is. Because if we're trying to manifest a world around us, that's like, the world that ideally we would want everyone to walk through you know within our sphere of influence like part of that 
is making space for it by destroying harmful systems that don't serve us. I feel like it's really easy to claim your capacity to create, but people are really afraid of their capacity to destroy. Because anger is scary, because we're taught women's yeah. anger is unwanted. Um, and we're taught it's bad rather than like a protective force or a boundary setter, you know, or something that can like clear space for something beautiful to grow. Absolutely. The, the whole world, the whole world recycles. Everything is recycled. You know, nothing on this planet completely disappears. It, it becomes something else. But for it to become mm -hmm. something else, it has to die. It has to be destroyed first. Yeah. So, so what are some things in your life that you've had to kind of tear down or, or destroy um, to move yourself forward? Mm, that's a really, really good question. It's a bit of a deep question, I just realized. <laughs> oh, I just had so many thoughts at once and they all canceled each other out. Um, but I did want to like add another thing to what you were saying about like creation and our, mm -hmm. how linked to magic that is. Like, I think so much of like you know like modern society um and even in a lot of spirituality we practice you know a lot of new age spirituality is about like oh transcend and leave your body and i think it's like a very like escapist dissociative thing um mm -hmm. and so i think like magic is so powerful like when it calls you into your bones when it calls you into your body when it calls you into the present moment i think yeah. that when you ask me about what i've had to destroy to make room for that creation um, I think it's an ongoing process of destroying internalized limiting beliefs, you know, about my own capacity, about what it means, like, to be like a woman, um, mm -hmm. or like, yeah, like just anything internalized in regards to, like, my own value and like patriarchal belief systems and you know, like ways you would never treat other people, but it's really easy to treat yourself or it's like really, really easy to Absolutely. places like when you feel hurt by someone. Um, and so like constantly like checking myself, you know, of my own integrity of like, oh, does this actually like align with my values or did I do I need to like reevaluate this belief that I've come to like allow to exist and grow within my body and find a right. way to purge it and get rid of it. And I think that's so much more powerful than pretending like we've already gotten rid of those things. You know, just because you don't believe something in your head doesn't mean that it doesn't exist within your body or it doesn't exist within you emotionally. That is so true. I I often have had to ask myself, it's like, is this something I actually believe or is this something I feel like I need to say or that is appropriate for the the time and place or the, the people I'm with? And it's, it's, like it's staggering how disconnected those are. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I don't even know where I picked up some of that, <laughs> some of that stuff. It's, it's so ingrained in us from every direction. I think a lot of us have been told for a long time who it is we're supposed to be or who we're supposed to want to be, the things yeah. we're supposed to do, the things we're supposed to, you know, add to the world. And it can be very difficult to untangle that and find out which of those things you actually feel for yourself, which you actually agree with. Yeah, absolutely. And this comes up with my tarot clients a lot in terms of, and it makes me really, really sad because so often, you know, I'm just asking them like, well, what are your dreams? You know, like what? Yeah. And why are these things not being fulfilled in your life? Or how can you better like manifest or like be on a pathway towards manifesting like your dreams, like these things you carry in your heart. And it's so sad how often nobody in somebody's life has ever asked them that, you know, or they were just expected to fit into this very specific social role and how they related to other people, but nobody actually asked them like, who are you? What makes you thrive? You know, what are like yeah. the that you actually like want to the come to the table with or want to come to your community with um and share because maybe your true gifts or like your fullest capacity um is actually not what you're currently sharing maybe that's just like a small portion of it absolutely i think that's um i think those are questions that i've been asked mainly in terms of, of witchcraft and my practice you know those are things from a young age when I, I um 
I was Wiccan as a, as a young kid, but those are questions you ask yourself, you know, what are your dreams? What do you want to do with your life? What do you want to see? What do you want to experience? What do you want to make? And it's as someone who's been practicing for so long, it makes me sad to find people who don't have any reason to question, like ask those questions of themselves. I think that's very empowering about witchcraft. It, it encourages us to it encourages us to to look inward and to get to know ourselves as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also like really sad that you know, like we put children through the whole school system and nobody's mm-hmm. asking these questions. Like on a day trip, <laughs> it's very like, oh, be subservient like to these things or these rules or meet these standards. But nobody's like, what do you want to fulfill today? You know, like what makes yeah. you happy and like did you achieve those goals and how can you better achieve those goals rather than yeah like, something on someone that's yet another thing that is like it seems like so basic it seems like such a basic universal yeah. um conversation to have with somebody but it's a conversation that makes a lot of people uncomfortable and i think a lot of um like you said i think a, a an important piece of magic is getting comfortable with some of the things that make you uncomfortable yeah and often actually finding a lot of power in those places after you stop trying to like push them down or you know absolutely power was something um you said this this really incredible thing kind of early in the film you said that women have um always understood power to be power with so that when they they come together, they are more powerful because they're all they're all engaging in that together. And in my head, I heard power with versus power over or control over. And um, that is another thing that I, I think society teaches us is that to have power, we have to have power over someone else or, you know, we're trying to take power from others and that will make us stronger. Um, how do you think witchcraft kind of enforces this idea that we're stronger together than we are apart, especially when we're practicing usually in a, in a solitary way? Well, I think that witchcraft, it's tricky because there are a lot of different worldviews, but ultimately, yes. like I feel like witchcraft is always reminding me, even as a solitary practitioner, you know, when I'm practicing by myself, um, it's always reminded me that my community is a lot larger and bigger than just people and that I have a deep responsibility to all of these communities. And so even when we talk about ancestry, you know, like we have ancestry of our blood and bone, we have ancestry um, of like the traditions and knowledge we've come to carry. We have ancestry of the lands that held us, allowed us to grow, held our ancestors, and also ancestry of like the lands that we're currently on. And we have like plant and animal ancestors. We have all of these different ancestors. And we have the ancestors that we're currently walking through the world and in the process of becoming ourselves. And we're part of that lineage. And so all of these are communities that we have to hold ourselves accountable to um, and show up for, you know, with good intention. Um, so I feel like witchcraft really puts you deeper as part of the world in those relationships because you realize that your community like involves the land around you. It involves like animals. It involves like all of these beings that deserve like integrity and respect and protection, but can't always voice it for themselves. And sometimes people too Mm -hmm. are in a position where they're able to voice those things or protect themselves and so I think witchcraft just draws you into like a broader web of relationships whether you're actively in that moment practicing by yourself or not it pulls you into this much larger community and for you especially something I I noticed in the film is that um, almost every time we see you you are not in a, a city setting, right? You are you are outside, you are in nature, you're surrounded by trees, you're, you know, standing by a river or a lake, you're, the mountains are in the background. Um, and, and it was clear to me, like your magical community definitely involves nature, um, just as much as I'm sure other things as well. But how do you find time to connect 
with nature in, in deeper ways when, you know, sometimes that can be <laughs> the access to that can be very cut off. How do you, how do you find time and space to connect with that, those more wild places? Um, I think it's just a matter of having a little bit of like discipline, you know, around just like leaving the house, going outside, getting out of my own head, mm -hmm. um, especially when I don't want to. Um, I actually think for me, sometimes it's easier to connect with nature um, than people. <laughs> like it's easier to like love the land and animals. And I have to like remind myself to have like a little bit more grace for other people. Um, and, I relate like, to that. <laughs> yeah, and like bring myself into like those human communities, you know, a little bit more. Um, I think early in the movie, I said like, you know, the reason I feel like I'm here is to sing to the land in her dying. So like I I love to sing, I love to write music, I love to create. And often I create, you know, for the land, for those spirits, you know, for my ancestors. And it's harder for me to think of my creation as for people, even though often like my audiences are like, you know, real breathing flesh people. Um, <laughs> it's not scary, you know, because all of a sudden, like, that takes it into the realm of like, is this good enough or like ego or like, yeah. what well think like it's easier to think of it as a gift that I would give to like the land or spirits absolutely nature um even when nature is is a little bit scary I never feel rejected by it <laughs> oh, <laughs> but I, but people I people I can yeah <laughs> yeah definitely I almost always feel safest in the woods at night which is I think where most people feel like the least safe because to me, it's often like large crowds of people where I'm like, no, like humans from each other, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, that's so that's so true. I think um, I think often when it comes to especially, you know, natural, like kind of wild places, we just we know we're supposed to feel um, uneasy there. We you know, I think we mistake caution for like a total fear. Like it's, it's, it's normal to be cautious. It's normal to be careful, but uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's okay to take that chance. You'll, you'll probably, you'll probably find something really interesting when you venture into those places that make you feel a little bit nervous. Well, it's an uncontrolled space, right? And like yeah. growth in the unknown is a little bit scary and it makes you feel a little bit nervous, but ultimately that's also like the beauty in life and the beauty in people. And unfortunately, yeah. I think as a society, there's like very much a tendency to control what is like wild and free and untamed and like have a lot of fear of the unknown. And so I think like shutting out, you know, like that traditionally, you know, like we made these villages and put fences to like shut out the wild and shut out the nature and mm -hmm. shut out the wolves and whatever it may have been. Um, so there is some survival instinct there, but I think it also cuts out what's really, really beautiful about human experience and our communion with the wild and like the wild within ourselves. I, I think witchcraft is, uh, is a little more in tune with, um, with that wild energy uh, for lots of people. I mean, not for everyone, you know, witchcraft is very, is very individual, but I, I think that's something that I've always loved about it. And getting to be like a part of that beauty. Wildness is so much part of like women's power too, you know, and like historically why there's been that fear. Yeah. Yeah. The, the fear of women who embrace, uh, you know, a wilder way of living or their freedom, their personal freedom that has scared, <laughs> that has scared people for so many thousands and thousands of years. You know, it's such a short, it's such a short amount of time that women have had, uh, something a little bit more like freedom and independence though we're we're not there all the way yet but I feel very lucky to live now versus you know even 50 or 60 years ago things were were so different mm -hmm. um and the connection between witchcraft and feminism is so is so overt <laughs> it's <laughs> it's so overt um and I, I think the film does a really great job of showing different ways to be a witch, different ways to connect with yourself, different ways to connect with um, uh, ancestry, especially ancestry and past lives that have to do with 
women and the way they've lived and the, the magical ways they've prayed. Mm-hmm. Um, what is it that, that you want people, whether they're witches or not, to take away from the film after they've watched it? I think that, you know, the only teachers that should guide you are the ones that lead you back to your heart. Um, was a really big one for me. Um, there are so many different people that you meet along the way in the movie who are like elders or high priestesses or mm-hmm. um, within those magical communities. And um, like meeting those people is very beautiful and there can be like a lot of power in those relationships, but just being really careful to not let anyone be an intermediary between you and your experience of the sacred because we all have the capacity to have that experience directly um, yeah, and be a part of magic and be a part of creation. And so like your power is not going to look like anybody else's because that's why each of us are like, you know, uniquely made in this world. Um, but like finding your gifts and sharing those things like with all of the communities that you're part of can be so beautiful. That's, that's beautiful. That's lovely. I think that is, um, I think that is definitely what I, what I felt at the end of the film. I I really felt, um, I, I felt very connected to my own practice in the way that it, you know, it doesn't look like anyone else's in the film. It's, it's my own thing. And when I got to the end, I'm like, that is such a, such a beautiful and empowering thing that this is something that I've created from scratch. It doesn't look like anybody else's. And I've gotten this window into seeing what theirs is like. And the fact that it's different makes me love it all the more. Mm -hmm. That was actually, (laughs) that was supposed to be the end of my questions, but I actually had one other thing um, that I wanted to ask you about because it was, it was so interesting. Both at the very beginning of the film and, and later when you're in Romania, Vlad the Impaler comes up Mm -hmm. and all the way through you are you are the storyteller in this film you know you you're very connected with folklore you have a lot of stories and I love them by the way but Vlad the Impaler came up at least two times and I noticed it because he as a figure is not he's not someone that I I hear people bring up especially not in a, a spiritual context I think he's really seen in the most villainous way and and just pure villainy you know he's he's the bad guy and you know <laughs> he's the bad guy you don't want to include the bad guy um but clearly that's not that's not the case for everybody of course um so Vlad the Impaler as a as a figure in um folklore and in spirituality why is he such an, an important figure in that um so I have like three different answers to that and <laughs> The first one, um, the movie starts off by talking about this um, traditional, you know, like folklore story um, where these stars are falling. And historically, they think this would have been a meteor shower. Um, But the people Mm -hmm. believed that they were dragons falling to the earth. And so wherever that dragon fell, it inhabited whatever being it landed on. So they don't have like physical forms like we imagine dragons. So if that dragon landed in a mountain, it became the spirit of the mountain. If that dragon landed in like an animal, then that animal was said to have a dragon spirit. Um, Cool. So it could inhabit a human and then that human would have a dragon spirit, dragon blood, or the dragons were also believed to be able to take human form. And this is where if they were women, they were called fairies. And if they were men, they were called dragons. So there's actually not a distinction. And their children with humans or each other would have the dragon blood and the dragon blood was believed to give like vitality and power and strength um and you know like aliveness like richness to the land and like bless the land and so the first thing about like you know vlad sipish dracula um vlad the impaler is that he was believed his dad was vlad dadakwa which means vlad of the dragon of the order of the dragon so he was believed to like be one of these rulers who like carry that dragon blood um the second is that when we went to balta vrajitwarelor the witch's lake um with the coven of traditional like romani witches in romania 
Um, mm -hmm. That's a site where it was believed that his head was thrown by his enemies. And so that lake, interestingly enough, like um, animals won't drink from it, they say. They say it's like wow. bottomless. They say they tried to like cover it up during communism. And within like a week, the lake was back and that it just <laughs> the bottom. And there's believed to be like a spirit that lives in that lake, but that spirit is considered a protector of women. Um, cool. And there are like stories about how that's come to be over the years. Um, so that also has a connection with him. I think that he's just like very prevalent, like in the folklore of those lands, not necessarily as like a positive historical figure, um, but just in like these connections to like the folklore of place. He's, I mean, he, it's undeniable that he was definitely a figure with a lot of power, mm -hmm. with a lot of power, a lot of, a lot of life and vitality. I will definitely give him that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and a lot I, of I his think... reputation is he was terrifying to his enemies, right? And that was yeah. also like in the interest of protecting his people. So yeah, in that way, he was definitely a, a servant of his people for sure. And um, I think when you when you said that it's important to honor ancestors, even if they're not, you know, they're not the most wholesome figures. Um, uh, to me, that was that was very connected there. And I think you're right about that. I think we have a tendency to to avoid these, these people that we consider the villain of every story um, and to not look at um, positive things about them or, or their, their interesting qualities, their folklore, their stories and their ways that they could be empowering. Um, and, and I noticed that with, with Vlad, I was like, what a cool figure to draw this very positive power from. It's just something I wouldn't have thought of. And, uh, yeah, I, I really liked that a lot. I thought that was very interesting. I think like, you know, we all contain like all of these different aspects. And I think like one of the most beautiful examples of that for me, like in the film was actually when Laura goes to Scotland and meets this man whose ancestors wow. like killed a lot of women for being witches. And what he's done is he's created this maze that he upkeeps to honor the victim yeah. of his ancestors' abuse, right? And that's one way, you know, like, in which you can honor your ancestors without celebrating your ancestors and be like absolutely part of this lineage so how do i heal that how do i like grow beyond this yeah yeah how do i how do i take that and make something positive with it he was a very interesting man he was a very interesting man i'm talking to laura tomorrow and um her journey was also you know so interesting so cool i am so glad that you guys got to um, you know, leave home and go to explore these ancestral places. I think it added something so rich and so, you know, so beautiful to the film. We got to see new places and, and the way other people either practice or um, live with witchcraft in their own life. And the, and the Romani witches you, you worked with in Romania, I've, <laughs> I've seen them in a, in a documentary before. I, I, shouted a little bit I'm like oh my god they're like celebrities like they're <laughs> a very famous witch family and what's really really cool is they are the only like so traditionally like your family or your clan has like a trade that you're associated with and traditionally that mm -hmm. would be like the main trade and so the Vrajitware are the only clan in which it's the women who practice and they're witches and that's their trade that is so cool that is so great. It's so amazing to see it, to see inside that, to see inside those traditions, you know, to to have an opportunity to see something that for the longest time was very it was very secret, you know, if, if you're an outsider, you don't get to see that stuff. It's it's so intimate. It's so mm -hmm. intimate. It was really beautiful. It was cool that that you got a chance to um to experience that, even if it was on camera, which I, I was like, oh my God, I would feel so weird. <laughs> so like exposed and overwhelmed because I also wasn't expecting it, you know? I had just met yeah. them and I kind of like told them who I was and, you know, um, I told them like my ancestry and then they proceeded to like initiate me on camera, basically. <laughs> and I was terrifying, you know? <laughs> it was like so raw and so vulnerable. And it's like, of course, yeah. you know, like I'm so honored to be like 
welcome into your circle and to learn from you and absolutely to to practice alongside you but like oh my goodness I would like never have chosen to do this in front of like (laughs) (laughs) yeah this is this is something I'd like to do where I can you know feel my feelings like right on the outside of my face (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah I uh that was so that was so amazing. I I lo- I actually really loved how quickly they they embraced you and they they recognized, you know, a, a kinship with you. I thought that was really very very cool. And they really believe like that witchcraft is part of your blood. So that's yeah. what they said to me. They were like you have the blood, that's why you're here. Um you're meant to be here. So um very cool. It's like a very very strong bond there with them. And I think it's like interesting that there's so many beliefs around like blood in that kind of part of the world as well absolutely that is it was so great blood like the fairy blood you know and they're like all deeply connected yeah and it's it it's something that you carry inside you just like you know just like um just like anything else that exists in nature it's it's something that runs through you and that powers you and that um you know gives you your strength yeah and very cool much a part of like romani women's tradition you know and historically Mm -hmm. Um, you know, with the tarot, especially, it's something that women could do, you know, if they didn't like have a husband, if they didn't have a family, if they like needed money, um, mm-hmm. a way to support yourself. And it was like one of the only ways to support yourself, you know, like aside. Yeah. From um, so I think it's like a really beautiful and like empowering thing. It's a, it's a real honor to see that passed down her her family is so beautiful. You know, first of all, they all look, they all look the same. They're so <laughs> stunningly beautiful. They're so beautiful. And it was, it was just really nice to see these different generations uh, all sharing something like that, sharing something so deep. Mm-hmm. So I, I was really excited to, I was really excited for that, uh, that whole section in the film. Uh, that was everything that I I had for you today. Is is there anything else that you would like to add about your experience with the film or or with anything that you got to do in its making? Hmm. I think that I'm just like very grateful, you know. I'm very grateful I got to have this experience. Like I feel like that magic is like still growing in my life. Um, mm-hmm. in many ways, and so yeah, I'm just like happy to be talking to you thank you yeah thank you this is uh this has been wonderful this has been a wonderful a wonderful conversation it was very organic which um makes me very happy that's how I that's how I like uh my show to feel I like to allow people to express things that are very real to them you know and not just a script so thank you so much for being vulnerable and for being open sure Um, I just thought of actually as um so my band just released their first album on, and it's called Willow Switch, and we play spooky, doomy folk music for the apocalypse, which is very like ritual, like witchcraft based. Um, and so that's on Spotify and Apple Music. And yeah. So yes, I, I have been streaming. <laughs> <laughs> I have been streaming it. Um, I'm particularly fond of Baba Yaga, but um, oh, thank you. of um, course, that's um, a banjo played with a violin, though. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, it's the instruments that I can I can hear uh, in your music is so like I'm constantly like getting closer to the speaker. Like, what am I listening to? This is so great. I get to hear something that I don't get to hear all the time. The singing saw when I saw you play uh, the saw in the film, I, I like I jumped out of my seat. I was so excited. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say. And then there's like the carpentry saw played with a violin bow, and like I love that wow. instrument so much. And I think it's like. To me personally, like in my personal witchcraft practice, it's so tied to that because, you know, you have this instrument that can be used to cut down a forest or, you Mm -hmm. know, build a house or make these beautiful haunting sounds like the wind through the trees. And so I think it's like such a beautiful way to think about like what has the capacity to destroy also has the capacity to create and like absolutely the songs of like those forests that are no longer there. That's so beautiful. And that's so, that's so true. I think that's, um, I think that's something that's so exciting about it is it's such a, 
you know, it's a saw. It has blades. It's it's mm-hmm. for cutting things. It seems like such a like a violent type tool, mm-hmm. but then the sounds that can be made with it are so um, emotional and ethereal and and beautiful. It's a it's a very interesting juxtaposition there. Yeah, exactly. It's like a brutalistic, you know, like carpentry tool. But I think there's like so much beauty in like taking these like old tools and using them to create new worlds. I agree. And it, it sounds lovely. You guys are so great. Like I said, I, you know, I'm following on Spotify now and I've been Thank streaming so the much. album and it's, it's, um, it's got such a, a cool energy, such a emotional um, energy. It's, uh, it's the kind of music you really feel, you know, versus just listening. So I really you guys should be very proud. It's a beautiful album. <laughs> All right. Well, I am going to, I'm going to let you get back to your, your very witchy life. Um, again, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, this, this was such a treat. Um, and, and I can't wait to, for everyone else to see the film and, and to share in that. Um, this has been fantastic. I'm so grateful that Andra made some time to come on the show, to talk to us, to tell us her experience making the film and you know, her own personal path of witchcraft. She, she shared a lot with us that's very deep and I, I'm so grateful to have that experience to both hear it and to share it with all of you. If you want to find out more about the film, you can go to covendoc.com and all of the links that you need to find out more about Coven and about Andra and her band Willow Switch are all going to be in the description of this episode so that you can explore them for yourself. I highly recommend checking out Willow Switch on Spotify. You will not be disappointed. If you are in Canada, you can currently watch Coven on CBC's Gem app. If you are not in Canada, say if you are in the US, which I know many of you are, well, you're out of luck. (laughs) That's showbiz, baby. Um, So the film is not currently being distributed in the US, which means if any of you work in the film or the TV industry, and you can contribute to to getting this film out there and and getting it a wider audience, I highly recommend doing that. Not only is it a really great and and meaningful and wonderful film, but it's it's also very entertaining. And I think um, it's not just, you know, educational. I think you could make some money off of it. As I said, this is only one half of a double feature that I've got for you all today. And the next episode will be an interview with Laura, another star of the film. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to treat this as an intermission. Get yourself a snack, make a coffee, go to the bathroom, finish driving home. You know, what? <laughs> whatever you got to do. And then tune in for the next episode because each of these witches had such a different experience in making this film. They come from different places and it's really, really fun. Laura's experience is also, I mean, it's wildly different. She does not know much about her ancestry and without giving too much away, I can tell you (laughs) that she follows the path of her ancestors to places like Salem, Massachusetts, Scotland and England. So that'll give you a little bit of a hint of what her um, ancestors contributed to the history of witchcraft as we know it. If you want to learn more about me or the podcast, you can visit thefatfeministwitch.ca. You can also look me up on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. To support the show and get access to some exclusive content and uh, monthly magical newsletters, you can find me at patreon.com slash thefatfeministwitch. I honestly, I couldn't do the show without the support of the patrons, and, and I'm, I'm so forever grateful. Every little bit helps.